We're at Drake's house. Little Wayne's on the couch. Little Wayne stands up and comes and gives me a hug. And he goes, I absolutely love your artwork, bro. I need to get more. Why I opened up the baseball school was I was home. I moved back in with my parents. So I was like, what am I going to do? Like, I need to get a job. I started reaching out to banks. What's your experience? Send us your resume. My resume had nothing. I was like, what if I reach out to every single team? And they say, I'll do free lessons for three months. The whole goal was to get in front of the parents. I was painting every night and weekend, slowly starting to get opportunities. They're like, hey, we have this other job. They're going to offer you 100000 I'm fighting to be this dude, to still sit in the cubicle, to not take my kid to sports right in the center of the mall yeah they had this open space and i'm like i i went to the leasing department i'm like i want to rent there we opened up on thursday night saturday morning all 30 paintings sell out what would be the average price for one of your pieces Welcome to Rise Podcast, uh, Life Stories of Accomplished Individuals. Thank you for joining me today. Today, uh, we have Anthony Ricciardi with us. Thank you. Did it's I get your last be, name correct? Yes, that's right. <laughs> Grateful to be here. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. We pulled this thing together last minute. Yep. Um, you know, you were coming to town. Uh, you had actually, we were introduced by Anthony and Ernesto from the Money Buys Happiness Podcast. Yep. Um, you know, we've become good friends. You told me you've been friends with them for, for some years. time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah great guys. Um, so yeah, so they introduced us and you know, you had graciously offered to come in and create a piece of art for us. Yep. So, you know, you've come to the house and I said, listen, if you're coming to the house, you got to be on the podcast. So we set this up last minute, the crew, everything, all these cameras. So thanks for doing it. So like last minute, no, thank you. <laughs> I no, really, I'm happy we put this together. It's awesome. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to jump in, um, in, you know, talk about your bio kind of not your bio. I, I want to jump in and I want to talk about, uh, some of your accolades. And, uh, so just people understand kind of, you know, it, you, you've taken a path that, in my opinion is it's definitely a road far less traveled with your beginning in finance and now you're like full time you're an entrepreneur an entrepreneur and an artist so yeah. i want to um, i want to go over a list of where some of your art is hanging to the the names of the people whose homes your art is in just to provide context uh, just to provide context for the audience sure. so Shaq, drake bad bunny Post Malone, Demi Lovato, Migos, James Harden, Damar Derozan, Derozan, yeah. <laughs> Derozan, Von Miller, Steve Aoki, Cardinal Official, Grant Cardone, Gary V, Lewis Howes. Yeah. Uh, these are big names. And it, what's interesting about it is that you're, you're a Toronto-born artist. Yep. Your gallery is in Toronto. Yep. How does someone in Toronto have such reach into the celebrity world, like these are these are A-list celebrities. Um, how does someone from Toronto who's operating from Toronto, an artist, and Canada's not, not to knock Canada, but Canada's not exactly known for, for its sure. output of creative geniuses. Yeah. But to be on this level, to have art hanging in the homes of artists. So these are these are people who, in their own right, are very successful creators, very successful artists. To be like an artist for artists. How did you have this kind of reach? Yeah, I think I've had to take, uh, thank you, first of all, but I think I've had to take a very outside the box creative approach to everything that I've done in the art world um, as a whole. So to take it back a quick second, you know, growing up, no one said become an artist. It's not a viable Clearly. career. Yeah. So it's like, it's not like, hey, go be an artist. You'll definitely, you know, make money doing that. So it wasn't something that I felt was viable my whole entire life. So you mentioned the finance thing. I, I, I went into finance, I got a degree in finance because growing up it was like, hey, like do something that's gonna potentially make money and do art on the side. So <clears throat> everything that I've done as a whole has been trying to think outside the box. So when you, referring to the, the celebrity side of the world, when I started painting, initially it was how can I reach out to like the people around them to hopefully, you know, get into their homes or get onto, like a lot of those I, I've done like clothing for, I've done custom jackets and you know, what, what, like just custom pieces for them. Um, but it was always because I want to think outside the box of like, if I'm, if my goal is here, like how many different people underneath that person or how many different tentacles around them can mm -hmm. I reach out to? Can I speak to, can I do paintings for, can I get in their it's, circle? Sorry. It's that strategic. Yeah. So, I mean, sure. this is, you're very much an entrepreneur because yeah. entrepreneurs think the way you're thinking, like entrepreneurs 
will kind of map out that network in order to get to their, you know, to their target, to their target clients. Yeah. So it sounds to me like, you know, your success in having your art placed in the homes of these people is, you know, it's a combination of just the quality of your work. And we're going to flash up some of your work. And eventually we're going to have one of your pieces here in, in our home. Um, so it's a combination of the quality of your work that resonates with these people, but it's also your entrepreneurial ability. And it sounds to me like that's something that sets you apart from a lot of other artists where you, you know, you are, uh, applying on, you know, your entrepreneurial skill. And I would guess that some of the things that you learned in finance and networking kind of in that, cause you went to university, sure. where yeah. did you go to school? I went to school at Alabama state on a baseball scholarship. So like very, very separate from like, I, I was in the sports world and the finance world and the art world. They're very, three very different, <laughs> but I do take, like like you just mentioned, I do take lessons and traits from all of these different walks of, of, of my journey um, into today. So like even just the work ethic, the the ability to wake up and, and work out even when you're sore, even like and work with a team, that was baseball. And then the creative side of it, a lot of people don't think of finance as being creative, but like I look, I work for a real estate investment fund mm -hmm. and we're doing hundred, two hundred million dollar land deals, development deals all, all throughout um, North America. I was having to sit in the rooms. Of course I wasn't leading the charge, but I was sitting in the rooms where people are structuring very complex deals and understanding how they can think outside the box and how they can, you know, work around this to be like, okay, no, that doesn't work. Let's go here. And so learning all those traits have now helped me in my art career because you know, I didn't have, because I didn't have a formal art training or I didn't even know like how to reach out to a gallery. Sure. Right? So I was like, well, why don't I start my own? So then and that's why like the, the, my biggest gallery that I had for the longest period of time was in York Dills shopping center, which is, um, it's a, it's a big, it's a, it's big, a luxury it's, mall. It's well, in it's, Toronto. It's, yeah. It's a luxury mall. It's the, I think it's probably the biggest mall in Canada, except yeah. for like, let's say West Edmonton mall, but it is definitely at the, at the top of the top. Yeah. So let's, let's, let, I also want to kind of understand, um, you know, your, your footprint as an artist in terms of the other things that you do. And I want to jump back into your story, but yeah. just to provide more context, uh, so people understand, like you've got a, an art gallery. You were saying, I think, recently uh, in Yorkdale, or you're moving from Yorkdale. Yeah, to so we're in Yorkville Village right now. Right. Um, where, where we closed the one in Yorkdale, but I have a bunch of different other. I do pop ups all over the world. So I just did a show in Australia um, last month, and I've done a numerous amount of shows in Miami. What other, what other countries? Because I was reading your bio, and there's yeah. a bunch of countries you've done. So I've done everything. I, I've done a show in London, Manchester, Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, and then I've done murals and installations. Everywhere in like Antigua, in Puerto Rico, in um, in Rome, sort of all over, really. Um, but but show base um, Australia, Miami, New York, LA. What are what are some of the brands you've worked with? Um, I've done a bunch of different brand collaborations with Adidas, Disney. Disney was probably one of my biggest. They they um, a very funny backstory. I started painting Mickey Mouse's, and everyone was like don't paint Mickey Mouse. Like they're going to come after you for, to sue you. And I was like, Oh, this, I should probably stop this. All of a sudden I get reached out to by representative. It's a marketing agency called viral nation. That was representing, um, I, I know, his, I know viral nation. Viral, yeah, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Sure. Joe and Matt are great friends yeah. of mine. And so Joe reaches out to me. He's like, well, Disney actually likes your stuff. And I was like, wait, what? What did you say? What you? I thought, I thought they were all about to get sued. I was like, I didn't know that. So then we ended up doing this whole uh, big collaboration of for a TV, um, commercial with them and I painted live at Epcot. It was awesome. So yeah, that was just a funny side story about Disney, but Disney, Adidas, L'Oreal, um, Capital One, um, yeah, a bunch of, a bunch of different brands and bigger and smaller. So, I mean, look, it sounds to me like in the art world, like as an artist, this is, it sounds to me like it's the pinnacle. Like this is like, this is the artist's dream. Like it sounds to me between your corporate clients, your celebrity clients, um, you and I just established, I had dinner with a friend of mine yesterday and I mentioned to him that you're going to be on my podcast. And he, he told me he has one or two, I think yeah. he has multiple pieces yeah. from you. Um, so you're obviously, you know, you're, 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 you, you have private clients, you have a, have a, you have a gallery, so you have a retail location. Like, it sounds to me like when I think of artists who, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm not really immersed in the art world, yep. I, I wish I knew more about it and hopefully yeah, you'll, we'll, you'll be we'll able to together, teach me, we'll, we'll, we'll hang out a bit, but um, like when I think of, when I think of somebody who has a footprint like this, I think like from back in the day, a photographer that I know I actually had one of his pieces, Peter Lick. Yeah, of course. Right. So when I think of that, where he's got like multiple galleries and, and whatnot. So it sounds to me like this is kind of the pinnacle. It's the artist's dream to do, to do what you're doing. But I want to, I want to go back to kind of the start because what's interesting is, you know, your path when you started, like, you know, as you mentioned, 
in traditional finance because it sounds like this is the influence. Make money. <laughs> yeah. Well, make money. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing, you know, you know, I'm guessing, Anthony, that your, your parents told you to go this route. Um, there's probably not one parent in the world who, you know, when their child told them, I want to be an artist, they said, yeah, let's like, you know, go for that. Exactly. Um, I, but I think that sentiment is going to be changing over time with the for internet sure. at scale, with kind of just, you know, just humanity evolving. But going back to kind of, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? 31. 31. So, I mean, you, you know, you're, you're a young man. <laughs> um, so take me back to kind of the circumstances under kind of which you like grew up. I know you're born in Toronto. Yeah. Like where, where are you from? Like, yeah, I'm from North York. I'm like, right, right. Just a suburb of Toronto. Um, my, you know, my parents are awesome and they, they definitely didn't say don't be an artist, but they wouldn't, it wasn't, they were, no one was cheerleading that. And my, my uncle, my uncle Fab, um, is my dad's brother. He was an artist growing up. And I mean, he was an artist when I was, I was growing up. Sorry. And, but transparently, like he never did well. And he would tell me like, this is a passion. And, um, it wasn't like it, it didn't, and he was transparent about that and everyone we can, we knew. So growing up, I was like, love art. Like uh, he's my biggest inspiration. My uncle Fab was my biggest inspiration. So unfortunately when I was in college, he passed away. When I came home, I got to look at all of his old art. I got to look at all his poetry, his notes. And it really inspired me. I think that was like one of the biggest, the catapults for me early, like early, um, in my career was like, why don't I try this? Like, you know, this was how old were you though? I was 20. Okay. Yeah. So it was like, yeah, I was 19, 20 years old, but I had been painting my whole entire life. But again, it was just passion, just like on the side. And you got to think of like, when as did a, you, sorry to interrupt. When did you first pick up a paintbrush? I had to be three or four years old. Really? Yeah. Like when I, I used to paint with him all the time and we used to go to art galleries and my dad took me to art galleries because he used, my dad was, my dad was born and raised in Italy, he came to Toronto when he was 16, 17 years old and, and very worldly lived around the world. So like we used to go to the museums and art galleries and everything. It was all, it was definitely appreciated in my household. It just, it was never just realistic. There was artwork throughout your, throughout your uh, home? Not, not really. No. Um, but, but just mainly because of my, my uncle. Um, so we had some of his paintings and stuff like that. Like it wasn't my parents aren't collectors by any means, um, or know much about the art world at all. Um, but they just, there was an appreciation. It was like, we go to art galleries. We went to the, you know, we go to the AGO, we go to the museum. So there was like this undertone of like, this is nice and we appreciate it. And not, and a lot of people don't know about it. Um, but it gave me that, like the key to be like, why don't I learn more? Why don't I try to like unlock what, what this whole world's about? And, um, and that's when I started going down, but you know, it's funny be, being an athlete, you know, and, and I joke about this with my, my coach lives here in Miami. Now my, my old college coach I joke about him all the time. And he goes, well, we used to make fun of you for painting. Like, you know, it's, it's funny in the locker room chat. Like, what do you go home and paint? Like, what do you, like, what do you mean? And, um, I mean, they're, we're all laughing now. It's all funny. But sure. at the time it was like, I, I didn't want to paint because it was like, well, that's sort of weird. Like, aren't you a baseball player? Like, aren't you going to go work for an investment bank? Like, what do you mean you're going to paint? So it was, um, I always dealt with that, like, you know, that positive and negative in my own brain. It's like, what do I do? So when you were, I want, I want to go, I want to go back a little more because I yeah. want to, I want to kind of establish your, um, the way you were raised in terms of the relationship that, you know, your family had let's say, with money specifically, yeah. because, you know, when, when you're doing something that you're passionate about, um, you always have this, um, kind of undertone of, <clears throat> how am I going to monetize my life? Essentially, how am I going to make money uh, to be able to have you know success and security? So early on, what was the relationship like that your family had with money? Were your family like were they nervous about money? Were they anxious yeah. about money? Like I, most, like most for sure. It, I, I it, mean, it, I grew sorry, up. Your dad was born in Italy, right? Yeah. So he was born in Italy, but you were born in Canada. Yep. So you're essentially first generation. So growing up in that kind of in, a, in an immigrant household mm -hmm. where he probably came here, I'm guessing in his teens or twenties. Yeah. In his teens. Okay. He, he came, um, my grandfather was, um, very worldly, spoke nine languages, was extremely successful. And, but by the time that my grandmother passed away young at like, uh, at 40 and his life, it, it, it spiraled down. So by the time I was born, um, my, I knew my grandfather not to have anything. And, and I, I, and so there, he, my dad sort of saw both sides of the world, like grew up flying around the world and eating at the top restaurants to, to not. So I, I got to see both of that. And I think that my parents always were, my dad was the first to be inspirational to do things, but there also wasn't an undertone like do what, do the safe thing. And it, it wasn't to anyone's fault or it was just really? like, it was just, yeah, it, it was. I, I, even though after seeing his father be as successful well, that's as he why, was. But he lost it all. 
like a lot. But he lost it all. It sounds like he lost it all due to um, um, outside forces, but also like self, but also like just crazy spending and, and living lavishly above means and all that fun stuff. But it sounds like it was grief too, because you're for sure. Grandmother that was the, the tipping point. Um, I think, I think that was the, the true tipping point, but I, I think for what I, what I was able to see and it, it wasn't money definitely wasn't a big thing that was talked about in my growing up. Like just as family, I grew up middle class, very comfortable. I got to, I didn't go without ever my, I'm very, very lucky to have a, such a loving family, but there was, there was always, I was very, I acknowledged around me, like there was no such thing as security. I saw people in my friends, family, aunts, uncles, like lose jobs that were there for 30 years. And it sort of kept telling me, I was like, what are, what are they doing? And even at a young age, I'm like, they keep telling me that's secure, but then they just got laid off. Why? Right. And did, did you ever have, did like, did you ever have a, like when you saw all of this was going on, did this ever create like a fear in you when you were younger of, I have to do something in order. I mean, I guess hence your yeah. career in finance, but it, did it create a fear in it you? Did. It did. It, I, I subliminally, it, it subconsciously, it definitely did. And I always wanted, I knew I always wanted to do well and whatever well meant at, at growing up, it meant like money. Like I, I had, a, I have a few uncles. I have a few people that I know that have done extremely well, retired young. And like, I got to see their lifestyle and I was like, well, I want that. And and because societal norms, we still grew up through the 90s, early 2000s, the societal norms is like take the safe route. And like you mentioned, it's going to be so much different for our kids because now we know there's so many different routes. And and in the late 90s, early 2000s, there wasn't. It just, it, it wasn't, so it wasn't as known. Was the, was the kind of the narrative in your home is like, you have to go to college? Um, I, I, I think so. Yes. But I, I also had such a passion for baseball that I want to go because I knew I wanted to get a division one baseball scholarship. So like, no matter what, like it was a, it was different. Like I didn't apply to any colleges. I didn't apply to any schools in Canada. It was like, I am going to play division one baseball or I'm not doing anything. So your plan was to become a, a professional baseball athlete. player. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. So, um, a, and I mean, the, I got close. It was, it was, it was, it was there. Um, I, I was, I'm not, I was a pitcher and I'm like relatively undersized to be a pitcher. I had dealt with some like elbow injuries and different shoulder problems, yeah. but, um, but ultimately that was the goal. And then, um, the fallback was, so what happened? Sorry. So you didn't, I mean, we're sitting here, you're, you're, yeah. not, you're not a professional baseball player. No. So what happened? So you went on a baseball scholarship yeah. to, you said Al Alabama, Alabama, State. Alabama State. Yeah. Um, and you're there. And how long were you playing baseball there for? So I did my four year, um, you know, my undergraduate degree there, got played for all four years. It was, um, it was interesting. I went to the backstory was I had nobody recruiting me. So this goes back to being creative and thinking outside the box. No one was recruiting me out of Toronto. I had like, I mean, there was nobody knocking on my door. Like we want to give you a scholarship. So I thought outside the box and I was like, how can I reach out to every, all 306 division one schools and tell them why I want to go there? So no one this was before you even went to school. This is this is in grade eleven. High school. This okay, is like yeah, yeah. yeah this is, this I is guess how fifteen you, years old. Yeah. This is how you got into. Yes. Okay. But it was it was pivotal and informative of how I do everything today. Like this this lesson for me. So, and then I, I took those three hundred six schools and I was like, wait, well, well, no one's gonna respond to me if I just send these blast emails. So I narrowed it down to fifty, and I was like. These are all, these are 15 to 20 reasons why I want to go to your school. And I emailed there, the coaches, the athletic directors, the trainers, like anyone. I was like, almost a little crazy. I was like, I want to go here. And a few schools started to reach out. And I was like, was, my dad and I traveled down to these schools and I got to meet them in person. They got to see me as for my character first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And then the baseball hopefully would just fall. Like that was the second part. My grades were good. I, I was always, I'm, I like school. I was a good student. So I, I had good grades and, and I was good at baseball. So I was like, I want to come here. I ended up going to a school that was in a transition period with coaches and like all this different stuff. So I, by literally getting my own scholarship, I ended up going to become like the pitcher of the year. I was an all-conference pitcher and I had a great four years as, as a captain and like all that fun stuff. What was your dad's response? I mean, you, 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 you I mean, <laughs> you reached out, you're a kid, you're yeah. a high school kid. You reached out, you got yourself into an American school on a scholarship as a Canadian. Yeah. So I would think that that's not, not easy doesn't to happen do. often. No. I would think that they would prioritize can, uh, U.S. citizens for sure. versus foreigners, and even in state, like yeah, for sure. Like so, you, you didn't get in on your the like on your on your baseball talent, or there was a component of it. Oh, there was a component. Like I still had to be good. Like it, right. it, there there was, but they never would have heard of me because of my baseball talent. My baseball talent wasn't right. what was these people were looking at the coaches. I think that's an incredible lesson. So one other premise for this podcast is I'm trying to pull out kind of lessons and I want people to to I really want to unravel how it is that people become successful yeah and I want to 
I want to touch upon this for a bit. So your proactive approach to being, I don't want to say, I don't know the level of baseball you were at. You were clearly at a good enough level. Division one's like in college is the highest level you can play. It's right, about, under, right under the major in, leagues. I'm, I'm saying, in I'm Canada? saying when you were, when you were a high school student still. So, you know, you took, you took kind of this, this kind of foundation that you had that you were probably, a, again, I don't want to make a judgment. You're probably a decent player. Yeah. Um, there's probably players who are better than you. There's sure. probably players who are much worse than you, but you were a, you were a decent enough player. And it, you just made a really interesting statement saying that you wouldn't have got into this U S school on a full scholarship mm -hmm. as a Canadian, you wouldn't have gotten in there had you have not taken this proactive approach and reaching out. Exactly. And you know, I can imagine you would draft these emails. You did a little bit of research uh, or a lot of research lot, yeah. about each school to really understand. And then you tailor made, um, you know, a, a letter. Videos, letter, calls, wow. all of it. And and I think that was formative. That's how I got my, my job in banking. That's how I got my start. Hold on, thing. hold on, yeah, hold yeah, on. No. Don't, don't, get, don't <laughs> yeah. get ahead of yourself. We, we have time. We have yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to understand this a little bit more. Yeah. So clearly what you did, that step in your life um, where, you know, you, you took your baseball skills, you then did these reach outs, you created these custom kind of um, uh, letters and reach outs and the videos and everything that you did on a per school basis, you you know, as you mentioned before, you targeted those, I think, 15 top schools or the 15 yeah, schools. That, yeah, 50. 50. Yeah, 50 yeah, yeah. schools. I want to make my range You wanted to bit, cast yeah. like a relatively wide net yeah. um, to increase your probability of actually getting yeah. getting somewhere, which is great. I guess what I'm trying to, under, and you were grade 11, were you 18? 15, 16. 15, 16. Yeah. So here's the quintessential question that I want to ask you because I think this is what people need to know. How does a 15-year-old kid take, you know, his baseball, which he's not going to get, no one's going to call you for your baseball. How did he take his skill as a baseball? How did you take your skill as a baseball? And how did you understand to reach out to these 50 schools, create these, uh, like, these detailed, essentially, you know, pitches telling the schools, each individual school, this is why you want to go. I'm trying to understand the genesis yeah. of this attitude two things i want to understand how you knew to do this who inspired you to do this and then i want to know how did you know how to do it because at 15 to create these pitches and to even learn how to get the email addresses of all of these qualified people i mean this is something i do in my business where we're reaching out to businesses uh, where we solicit you know clients i know this i'm 50 years old and i know yeah. this three years how did you know at 15 yeah to, to how to do all of this I, I was always a sponge. I always like looked at people above, I'll say the word above, like above me or that did beautiful things. And I tried to take little, little tidbits from each one of them. And, and one big thing that I noticed through all of these people, and you mentioned it was casting the web. It was, it came down to math. It was always for me, it was like, what, how much do I have to do? Cause I only needed one school. Right. I didn't need many. I was like, if I just have to keep expanding my web and keep trying different things and to, because I, I've, I've always felt older than, than I was. So like, although I may have been 15 and my friends may have been like hanging out in the summer, I was emailing schools, making videos. I, I found, I figured, taught myself how to build a website that I can, I made myself a website, anthonyrichardi.com to send to these colleges, which is very weird. Like, why do you have a website? You're a baseball player. So, but I, I did all that because I wanted to just be different. And I think that's where the creativity in me came like from a very young age. Maybe it was the drawing, maybe it was going to the galleries, all these different formative points. Um, I just want to think outside the box. And I always was very, very eager to like do different things. And I knew, I knew we have, I mean, cause already like media and the web and everything was already big. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not like it was 15 yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah. It wasn't, it, it was only 15 years ago. And I was able to see all these people doing these incredible things around the world. I'm like, well, why can't I? Like, well, I don't have to stay here and just like work a job or I don't have to stay here and go to a Toronto college. And even if the education was better in Toronto, which it probably was, I was like, I want to go experience this thing. And my, my, and I think because my parents were supportive of it and, and, and my dad, like, I mean, I played, you know, the Toronto area, but like, I, I grew up in Toronto. I played baseball in Hamilton because it was the best team in, yeah. in Canada as a kid, as a, as a kid. So like my dad would drive me an hour and I, and I mean, now as a dad, I can look back and be like, Oh my God, I'm so grateful. But he also saw my work ethic. And I think that I, I was willing to do whatever it took in the, on the field and off the field to like make things work. And, and so because of that, I just didn't, I kept looking at different angles and I would try a thousand things. Where's the work ethic from? How do you get it? How did you get it at such an early age? Yeah. Um, I, I just think, it's a great question. I, I, I'm not, 
Can I tell you something? Yeah. Nobody knows how to answer that question. Anybody who Such I've asked in these interviews, either in the in an interview or outside of an interview, when I talk to really accomplished people in whatever their respective fields are, nobody understands where it comes from. Yeah. And I guess the big question is, is if you don't have it, how do you gain it? And that's something for me with my, with my kids. As you know, I have three yep. sons. You actually met all three of them this yeah. morning awesome. uh, on their way to summer camp. Um, that's, I think, probably one of my biggest fears is how do I instill this in my kids? And, I, you know, I would and I, I, I unfortunately think you, you won't be able to answer the question because you have it naturally. So let me let me I'm going to flip it. There one one point that I can find from a very young age that I can remember is I tried so many things like at 11 I, I started my own clothing brand and like at 12 I was I made jewelry at, at 15 like I had a, in Toronto like a big clothing line at 15 like I would just try things and I think that was the key like I, I played so many sports growing up I played soccer and baseball and hockey and I was probably better in soccer and hockey than I was in baseball I just had more passion in baseball so I think by trying I think the truth is that not enough people try things they're they're content in their ways and they just they just like this here's the status quo i'm just gonna do this i tried so i'm a funny story like i was a rapper in college like i i, I yeah like i opened up for like two chains and like i, I have a rap album it's like you know it's a true story you have a rap album? yeah don't even ask don't ask to see it or hear it it's horrible you know i'm gonna find but, it right? <laughs> you know i'm gonna find it but it's 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 funny because like i tried so many things yeah and i and, and i i think that was the key to it all was that you take all these lessons and then like along with having you find passions in these things some things i didn't like and then i just you know move it to the side but some think, things do you I think liked. sorry to, sorry to interrupt no, 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 do you fine. think that all people have the ability to have this kind of work ethic and this kind of curiosity to take this work ethic and then to plug it into a curiosity to explore all of these different things do you think everybody has the capacity to do it yes 100 percent. i think people that society has made people content with like this is this is what you should do and this is the way to go and this and go do this and you'll be comfortable you have a three-year-old son. Mm -hmm. we, we, we chatted about it um, yeah. before we sat down here. Um, I guess, how do you plan to create this type of um, proactive, strong work ethic kind of, you know, um, growth mindset yeah. in your son? It's early now. He's three it years is, old. It and is, it's, and it's formative. And I, I, I think, and, and you know this as well. Um, I think it's, it's experience based. I think t I, we really, I mentioned like, this is probably like my second or third trip ever without them, but mm -hmm. he's got to experience the world as I have in over the last three years. And he grew up in, in Yorkdale talking to people. He's, he's very talkative and he's like, he's like a character. He's an actor, this, this little guy, because he's always been out with us. And I think that was a formative thing for him. And, and every kid's different. And I know that like some, some kids are more shy and stuff, but I, I believe by putting him in these situations, um, and similar to how my parents did, like I was always out and about and as well. And I think that it was, it's very formative. So I think the, and giving them the confidence is what I'm going to try to do is just, you know, if he seems to like something like go into that, like he seems to like tennis right now, let's put him in all the camps that he can until he says, daddy, I don't like it anymore, which is perfectly fine. But the goal is to keep pushing them. If they seem to like something, let's, let's push them in that direction or at least support it and guide um, as much as I physically can mm -hmm. for me that it just came, it came internally and like, and it, it didn't, it sounds crazy to say this, but like if my uncle was still here, would I be an artist? I, it's sad to say, I don't think so because I think he would have turned me off of it. Were you, because he was saying he he would have told you there's no money. In it. Yeah. He would just said like, Hey, like you're doing good, buddy. Like you're in finance. Like, what are you doing? Like, don't, but that's a things. hard, but that's a hard thing as a, a as a parent or as an uncle, not to say to a kid, right? It is. Because you just want the best for them. I, I right. see it now. Like, I make the joke all the time. Like, oh, is AJ, my son's name is AJ. Is AJ going to be an artist? I'm like, no, he's not going to be an artist. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing to say. But it, you do, I, I look back and I don't, people are like, well, because my, my parents said, don't be an artist. And my, my uncles that loved me said, don't be an artist. But all they were saying is, they were saying it for themselves. I look at it now as I talk to my son. I'm like, I want to go to bed at night knowing I did everything in my power to make sure my son is okay. And they did the same thing for me. So they're yeah. like, hey, you're making good money at 20 years old. You're, you're working at a top investment fund. Why do you want to risk this? Like, what, like they know what struggle's like. You know, it's 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 interesting. I just like to draw a parallel. I remember before I started my first business, I was in my late 20s already. And I was making back then... Thirty thousand Canadian dollars a year, mm -hmm. which uh, even by even back then that wasn't a lot of money. And I remember I went to start my own business, and my father he said to me, he said like, "Why are you risking this?" So, you know, he obviously was talking obviously you know from the best uh, the best intentions, and I think that's what happens with parents. And even though like 
you know, I remember even telling him, Dad, like, it's not a risk. I can always get a crappy job, right? Yes. Like, that was, I, to go, to skip the job part, I, so I was 24 years old. I was making $100,000 a year. Hold on. I, before you go, before you go there, yeah. before you go there, I want to, I want to get back to that, but I want to, I want to go back to college. Um, and I want to understand what's happening in college. So in college, you, you're now there, you have your scholarship. Um, so financially you're, you're good. Like you, you know, you have your scholarship where you, my parents still supported, like, you know, I, I chose to live off campus for a few years and I was, I had my parents as, as support for like, you know, those, those, those sure. finances and but, stuff, but, but education was paid, but it's, a, I mean, that's a big, that's a big portion of it. The fact that you had that, the fact that you as a teenager were able to take care of that yourself, Yes. the, you know, the education portion of, of, uh, of the costs Yes. and they helped you with whatever sure. kind like, of, you know, yeah, other you know, things. Food, food, like, all sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure. But I mean, that's, that's huge on its own. Okay. So you're, so you're there, you're playing baseball, mm -hmm. you are, uh, and you're studying finance. Yeah. Like and, and, and without anyone really knowing, especially on my team or my coach, like I was painting. So I was in the Alabama. And you were painting. I was in the Alabama art gallery and my school's art gallery was the only non-art student ever allowed to show artwork in the gallery, in the, in the college. No one knew I was doing it. Like no, my friends, not my coaches. Sorry, you weren't allowed to show. Oh, it was only for art students. Like it was the art gallery oh, for the, for the university. Um, so all the art students showed their work in this. And I, I ended up pitching to the art teacher. I was like, listen, I, I have this passion. I want to showcase my artwork. Like, wow, can you help me out? And he really, he saw that drive in me and was like, he gave me the opportunity to showcase my artwork in a gallery. Um, the only non-art student to ever do it, which is super funny, but I didn't tell anyone, like I didn't tell my coaches, they would have just laughed at me and they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have supported it. How was your art received in the gallery? It was great. Yeah, it was, it was all of my early paintings. Um, at this point, my uncle had passed away were, were renditions of his artwork. He's using inspiration really? to me. Yeah. So like he did these very like big abstract faces and writing and stuff. And I did those as well. Just again, it was like maybe a coping mechanism for me looking yeah. back. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was definitely a, uh, he was my inspiration. So I did those paintings and I did a series of them for the, for the gallery, which was, was really fun. Got it. Okay. So you're in college. Yeah, baseball You're every day. Baseball every day. Finance studying. every day. Artwork at Sometimes, night. Sometimes, yeah. Okay, so you're you know you're you're triple tracking. You're 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 in college. You're doing all three things. What's going through your mind at the time in terms of okay, where am I going? Like, did you did you have anxiety about what you're going to be doing, yeah. or did you feel safe about the fact that you're in finance? You kind of knew, okay, I'm going to get a six figure job when I graduate. What was your what was your thinking in terms I, of because you had done so much to get to where you are. You're there. And by the way, like you're in a foreign country. You're in the United States. You're in, in Alabama. Montgomery, Alabama. Montgomery. <laughs> Very different. <laughs> Montgomery, Alabama. So like culturally worlds apart from where yes. you were before. So, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of dropped into this into this new culture. Um, small town USA. Mm -hmm. um, you don't. I'm assuming you don't have any friends there. You're there completely by yourself. Yep. That must be scary. You're doing these three different things. Um, how was it for you? And I just want to briefly touch upon this. Like, how was it for you socially? And were you ever at a point where I was like, shit, I got to get out of here because there's nothing going on in Montgomery. The good thing, the good thing about being on a baseball team was I was immediately had 50 friends. So I actually didn't feel that, um, the social part of it because you're, you're put it, you're thrown into a team and all that teamwork building, why I believe so much in team sports for kids, the teamwork building, working with others, um, was formative for when I got to college because all of a sudden you get there there's 55 kids on the team you're like these are your brothers now wow so figure it out you live you all live together like I lived with 12 of them like it was just you you just you're always there with each other and there's some of my best friends today like in my wedding party like see them all the time um so I that part was actually easy it was actually the easiest part was the making the transition for friendships and and that thing because it just I had to become friends with these guys I think I think you're it's, I think it was easy for you because I think a lot of other people, especially when they're kids and they're, they leave home for the first time and they're as busy as you were with the responsibility of your education, the responsibility of the sport that you love so much that yep. got you there because I'm guessing that there was a certain amount of pressure on you to perform in oh, baseball sure. in order to continue getting the scholarship. Yep, 100%. So you, so you have this kind of, um, like you physically need to perform as an athlete. You academically need to perform as a student. You have to keep grades or else you get cut. Yep. Okay, so... You have you have pressure on you to perform physically yep. as an athlete. You have pressure on you to perform academically as a student in order to keep your scholarship and in order to finish with your degree in finance. And then the art side, it sounds to me like the art portion of your life at the time, that wasn't that was pleasure. It was one percent. Like it wasn't even anything. Like it wasn't even a thought, really. And there was you mentioned the word pressure. Because all my friends growing up and, and my cousins and everything back in Toronto, 
every summer they did internships. They got jobs. They worked at banks. So whatever, like, you know, whatever it is. What you did know, you in do college, in the summer? Play, had to play baseball. In Alabama? So, in Alabama. So you stayed there the whole four years. You didn't I, come home. I came home for three weeks um, in July and then two weeks at Christmas. That was it. And because the baseball season ends in late June, so then you, you train, and then you're right back there in August 1st to, to train again. So I I graduated, and this is where like the stress and pressure came in. I graduated with, like, I worked at Foot Locker for, like, three weeks. <laughs> like, in the summer, one yeah. summer, I had nothing on my resume. <laughs> and all my friends from Toronto, um, so after I didn't, I didn't get drafted, I spoke to a couple different teams. I had some opportunities in to go play in Europe and stuff. And I said, you know what, I'm going to move on with my life. I got a degree now. Let's go back home. And I, I get home and all my friends are like, yeah, I'm working at this bank. I'm working at this bank. I'm working at this fund because they had four or five years of experience. But you had your degree, but you had your degree in finance. Yeah. Yeah. But so did all day. Like the one, all my friends that went to Western or Queens and everything all, also had a degree in finance, but they also had four years of, of internships, uh, of like work experience, which is, was important at that age, right? They, you know, the banks that are going to hire you at the entry level analyst jobs, they want a little bit of experience. Right. So what did you do? So now you have, so, so, okay, so you come back, you're back in Toronto, you now have the pressure of finding a job. So yeah. you consciously decided to leave baseball. You weren't going to pursue it professionally. I could have played like semi-pro in Europe and stuff like that. And it wasn't, it wasn't interesting enough to me. So yeah. Do you, do you feel that if you would have pushed harder on baseball and if you would have made the attempt to, um, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to diminish your, your efforts or what you accomplished in baseball, but do you feel like if you would have pushed harder on baseball, then you would have professionally been a professional player? I think I, I truly maximized what my body was capable of. Okay. There was a certain point in sports where I, I could have done things a little differently thing, but like I, I did hit a threshold in my body frame and, and, and for the position I was at. If so you never had, sorry, you never had any kind of like regret. No. You never had any negativity around like I could have, but I, you know, so, so you feel, you feel satisfied. And I think that's, I think that's another important lesson that if you pursue something, if you try something and I'm just, I'm really dissecting yeah. your attitude because yeah. I'm a strong believer that attitude is really one of the things that drives progress and success in, in individuals. Your attitude when baseball came to an end for you, like even though you were you were crazy about baseball since you were a little kid and you got, went on a baseball scholarship and I'm sure somewhere in the back of your mind or maybe in the forefront of your mind while you're doing the baseball and the finance and a tiny bit of art, you're thinking to yourself like finance is like a backup plan but yes. I'm going to be a professional ball player. And when that didn't happen, you didn't collapse. No, and, and it was actually formative to the next steps because what I was able to do was I looked at what, what my strengths were in baseball. While I was like panicking because all my friends were getting these jobs, I said, what did get me to Division One? Obviously, my work ethic, blah, 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 stuff, but it was mechanics. And what I realized was, I, I, when I say mechanics, I'm like literal sport mechanics, like literally pitching mechanics. And all my friends that grew up in Texas, Florida, Puerto Rico, they were taught how to pitch. Like growing up, they had, they they had pitching schools. Were or they were they not? Were. They, they were. They were. I see. In Toronto, like the indoor facilities and like a, a pitching coach specifically wasn't even really a thing. There was right. a few. But I, I was like, wait, this is an opportunity for me. This is where the entrepreneurship comes back into play. And there, it was twofold. I said, what if I come back and I can keep my baseball bug going? I never really left baseball. But as soon as I came back, I started coaching kids. I said, I can teach the next generation of Toronto Bay athletes what I'm being taught in, in Alabama, what what my friends are being taught in Florida, because we are not being taught. So that now in you Toronto. have the idea to go into coaching. Exactly. So you finish your finance degree. It was, but it was to... one specific reason why I want to go into coaching. I'll, I want to give back and I want to be a coach. You had a baseball but, school. You told me before. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So why I opened up the baseball school was the first um, three months. I said. I need to get a job. I was scared. I was home. I moved back in with my parents. So I was like, what am I going to do? Like, I need to get a job. I want to, sorry, I, I apologize. No, I, I really feel bad interrupting, but no. I, I really want to make sure I draw the value out of this. When you say you were scared, I understand that fear. You know, yeah. I've had, I've had that fear at various points, you know, in my life, depending on kind of what's going on. But with that fear, especially when the fear around, you know, finances, knowing that now you're an adult, you're not a kid anymore. You're yeah. an adult. You have to take care of your own finances. How do you cope with like, how did you cope with that fear at that time? It, it, I just kept thinking of different things to do. Like I, I was all these little trinket brands and all these little things I was doing. They had no legs to them. Like I didn't have enough passion in them. They weren't great ideas, you know, looking back at them, all these different things. So I was like, well, I had to really have, have a sit down. And this is where I think I've, the different things I've done well is like truly sit down, look myself in the mirror and be like, what am I good at? What can I execute right away? And how can I start today? Did you have a mentor through all of this thought process or you figured this out on your own? I, I read a lot growing up, but no, I didn't. I like, I, I just, I really just genuinely figured it out on my own. Where your your parents weren't capable of advising you? Um, again, like they they were supportive, but they weren't like my 
no, I, I would say like, no, they weren't, they wouldn't definitely all the different things I did, like I did on my own terms with support, like in terms of like, yeah, good idea, or that's a dumb idea. And I still did it anyway. Um, but yeah, so no, is I bounce almost, I talked to my dad 10 times a day and or was, was like best friends. I still bounce a lot of ideas off him, but it was never, it, it wasn't the formative reason I did anything. Um, and I can say that transparently now back then it was scary because you sure. want to make them proud and you want to make them happy and you want them to be able to be like, Oh, my son's doing this. So tell me about, okay. So you're in a, you're in a situation now where, you know, you're back, you have all the experience that you, you have to date, um, painting, you know, your, your artwork is kind of on the back burner. Yeah. You open up the baseball school. Yeah. So why I did that was I started reaching out to banks and firms. I, I use the same concept from getting my scholarship. I'm like, this has to work. All of them like, what's your experience? Send us your resume. My resume had nothing. So I'm like, no, I have to take a different angle at this. And this is where creativity came into play. So I said for three months, I'm going to reach out, like, especially in the areas like for people that know Toronto, like I was in North York and Forest Hill and Etobicoke and all these different, these little areas of, of coaching kids. I was like, what if I reach out to every single team and I say, I'll do free lessons for three months. And the whole goal was to get in front of the parents. Truly, I can say this. And it was my goal at the time. You can ask my wife and my, and my, uh, my parents. I was like, each one of these teams have 12 to 15 sets of parents on them. At the end of every practice, I'm just going to tell them about myself, tell them about my degree, tell them about everything I've done. And I bet I only needed one. I bet one person one day is going to be like, we'll give you an opportunity. From that, I would, that's, I did, I did free lessons for months before I, I ended up opening up a pitching school. Cause it was, it was, it was lucrative. Like I got, I, I could coach kids and it was great. But before I did that, I started talking to all these parents. I was doing free lessons for the kids. They saw I was, you know, eager to work. I was a hard worker and all the different stuff on and off the field. And then I got a bunch of job offers. Like parents were like, well, yeah, we actually like you. Like your degrees in finance. Okay, cool. You have no experience. It's all good. You'll come work for us. Sorry. Hold on a second. You got job offers from parents that I coached to like do, kids. to do what? In finance. In finance. Yeah. So Sorry, like, I, I missed that. Something yes. went over my head. Hold on. Something went over my head. How did you know that the parents of these kids were in finance? No, I didn't. I would talk to every single parent. I didn't you know. You would talk to every single parent to qualify and find out what it is that they do. What's their background? Twofold. I, a little, a little back ended. I would, I mean, I had all the lists of parents and I, I would type in some parents' names. Like I no, yeah, no yeah. shame in that at all. No, no. And, um, I know one specific, uh, one mom, she was CFO of Craft Canada and, um, I, I saw her online and I ended up, I walked right up to her after one practice. And I was like, by the way, like you know, I, I've been coaching your son for three weeks now. And like, this is a little bit about me. I want to get in finance. And she actually offered me a job of craft. That was an wow. early, one of my early um, offers. I didn't end up taking that one because I ended up working for another parent <laughs> from a different team. So it was a parent. So your initial job in finance, you got from this yes. roundabout way. Yes. So again, because I didn't, they would have never, especially these firms, I were, it was a, a big real estate investment fund called Romsman in Toronto. Um, they would never hired me just off the street. Like it was just, so why would this they is, have? it's a reoccurring kind of pattern of genius in your life where, you know, you had gotten into school again, not based on the, the premise that they were looking for, which is like excellence in baseball. baseball. And when you got back <clears throat> from school and your goal was to get a finance job. You had the strength still in baseball and the credentials in baseball. And you took this alternate route mm -hmm. by offering to coach kids for free, yep. figuring out which parents are potentially in the field that you want to get into. Okay. So instead of going through what your friends who had stayed, let's say in Toronto and got their finance degrees and they were interning in the summer and they already had those kind of co-ops or whatever yep. you call them, yep. those, those, you know, uh, or internships. internships let's say. Yep. So they already had their internships. You with, out any of those internships, you were still able to take the assets that you had in your life, you know, through your baseball, um, and then kind of parlay that into, you know, offering, offering parents free uh, coaching for their kids for baseball, meeting them. those parents, establishing. So again, um, yeah, uh, I, I think I, I really commend you for that because that's obviously the, you know this is a this is a this is a genius move. So you got a job in finance. Who did you get a job in finance for? Which which it's parent? Who was it? Uh, his name is Wes, uh, Wes Roitman. He was, he was, so the funniest thing is I actually didn't know what his role was at Romstead. I was talking to, it was a group event and one of the parents was a big supporter of me. He was a veterinarian and he goes, um, obviously I wasn't going to become a, uh, get, get a job at a veterinarian, but he, after practice one day, he goes to the entire team and says like, by the way, guys, like. Anthony's been helping us. He's he's awesome with our kids and like he's doing everything. He's actually looking for a job. Like if anybody wants to like you know chat him, he's finance degree, entrepreneur, all these different things. And he was just very nice to do that. Like he didn't have to because I was gonna eventually he's gonna slowly go into eventually. 
So one of these dads um, comes up to me the next day and he's like, hey, by the way, like we have a couple opportunities. Like, why don't you come by the office? I did not know what he did. Um, and I, I didn't didn't know what his role was. I, I, I show up... Um, I look him online and it says partner and to be totally transparent, like I didn't even know what a partner of a finance fund sure. was at the time. Yeah. I was like, I a oh, partner. Okay, cool. Like, yeah, he has a job there. Like, that sounds good. I genuinely did not know. Right. I show up to is an office in Yorkville, like right, right in like uh, 162 Cumberland. And I go upstairs and he is the head partner of the entire firm, a $2 billion under management, uh, real estate fund. And like, he's the, the man in charge. And I was like, Wait, what? So I go into the the late the the HR's office, and she's like, "Okay, yeah, Wes said you're gonna start working here." I'm like, "Oh, am I? Like, that sounds great." And she's like, "Well, yeah, like Wes says so. Like, yeah, it's done here. Like, when when do you want to start?" And I was like, I, "They didn't even have a role for me. It was just like, hey, you're in finance, you'll figure this out. Like, we'll we'll start you at like an entry level analyst job, mm -hmm. and then we'll just we'll make it work." And that that's how it all happened. And I had at that time. I had a, a four or five other job opportunities, um, a mortgage fund, craft, a couple of from things the from baseball. baseball, all from baseball. Wow. Every one of my opportunities, again, like I, cause I didn't have anybody in the, my dad's from the food industry. I didn't mention that earlier. My mom works at a hospital, um, as an executive assistant. So like no one in my life was in that space. Like there was no, um, there was no one to say like, Hey, here's a finance opportunity or here's a finance internship. So literally it was just by myself and I, I knew I, I wanted to do it. So I, from baseball specifically and uh, because reaching out to people didn't work. So I was like, I'm going to use the baseball angle. And that's how, that's what got me my first job. Okay. So, it was Romspen Investment Corporation was the name. Okay. So this is, and this is the real estate investment firm. Yeah. Ooh, Two billion under management. Yeah. How long were you there for? Uh, five years. Five so years. I, so uh, as, as a really, really key part of the story was I was in charge there for four and a half years. Yeah. And during that time, I painted every single night and weekend. And this is where the transition into art I was gonna, started. I was going to I was going to get to that, but before you get into the transition in, in art, like you you earlier you mentioned you were making like $100,000 a year there. So you're a young kid in your 20s making 100k. I so mean, it, it was actually a little bit later. This is where a pivotal part into me transitioning to art was. I was I, I think I was making 52,000 a year uh, at at my, my my analyst job when I first started. Yeah. And it was a great environment. I love. I still to this day have all my uh, great friends at, at that place, at Romspen. And You're still friends with the the head guy there. Yeah, yeah, of course. And and like I had my old boss and like all my old colleagues. I like, still see them all the time. They're they're incredible people. What happened was I I started painting every single night and weekend, and I still didn't think it was real, but I started saying, well, why don't I host my own art shows on the side? And everybody in my in the fund was supportive of me. Like some of my earliest collectors were partners of the fund, were colleagues. Like, I mean, my art wasn't very expensive at the time, so it was very, it was approachable. And what ended up happening was I thought, I, I started selling art. I was like, oh, I can make this a thing. And at these art shows that you were these doing. little art, I would I would like rent out a little space on Ossington. I'd rent out a little space in Yorkville and do like a two night pop-up. All my family and friends would come, okay. nothing big, like little small little pop-ups. Um, you know, a thousand bucks for the night, rent it out and just have a little party. And so that's what I would do. And what ended up happening was I ended up getting um, a headhunter from another finance company came to me. And I was, again, I was making 55, 52, 55,000. And they're like, hey, we have this other job. They're going to offer you 100,000. And I was like, that number doesn't even make sense. What do you mean? I'm like, I'm super, I mean, that sounds like crazy money. And it, I had this time where I was painting every night and weekend, slowly starting to get opportunities. Nothing, nothing of dollar amounts, like nothing, to, nothing real. And I was like, Oh my gosh. I'm like, well, I don't want to be, I had this, this lapse in my brain. I was like, I don't want to be an artist. I just want to make money. Like, what am I doing here? Forget art, forget these friendships. I was like, I'm going to go make money to me. A hundred thousand was a trillion dollars. I don't know. I was still living at home. It was going to let me leave home. And I was like, okay. Um, so I took the job and I remember my boss telling me at the time it wasn't West. It was in my, my direct boss. He goes to me, um, He's like, I think it's gonna be a, it's, a, it's a lateral move for you, even though it's the finance or more. He goes, so like, you I were think you were transparent with him. You said, Listen, very I got, transparent. I got this, well, I mean, and he knew about my art, and he goes, you're gonna be an artist. He's like, he's like, this is this is a, a lateral move, and I'm like, no, like I'm like, because he couldn't compete with the dollar amount. He's like, I'm not, we're, we can't pay you that. So like, go, I, I'm proud of you, but he's like, you're gonna be an artist though. And six months later, um, on the the night I closed my first house, the week of my wedding. Sorry, you closed your first house. You like bought, I bought a house. You bought a home. Wife, based I bought a home in Toronto. Based on, based on new this salary. New salary. Yeah. Based and on you, were, you were married already at this time? No, I was the week of my wedding. So I was a Tuesday. I was how, getting married on Saturday. How old were you when you got married? I was 26. Okay. I've been with my wife since grade 10. We've been together for 16 years. 
Wow, but, yeah. wow, you just threw something else. Hold on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Other thing. Where was she? Where you were when you were in Alabama for four she years? She went to UFT. We we stayed together. She wow. would come down. She would come down like so twice a semester. You had so on top of everything else, you had this kind of. Did did it feel sad for you to be I, apart from your girlfriend for so long? We, you know, she's incredible, and I, I was so lucky to have her. It made me focus. I I wasn't focused on all the other junk that all my friends were focused on. Like I wasn't running They're, around with anything. Chasing girls, I, I, I genuinely wasn't. I wasn't. I knew how good I had it with her and she was fantastic and, and I, w- I was so grateful to have her and you know obviously being away has its challenges but like we got to see each other also often and she got to focus on her her degree and she had, she went to uft it was a hard university and i got to focus on on training and everything and those four years went like this they went really? by so quick how often did you guys see each other she would come down twice a semester and then so like so wow. so for like a week at a time and then um, and then at summer, I would come home for three weeks and Christmas, I'd come home for two weeks. So it was like not much in reality, but it was still, um, we made it work and it was, I'm, I'm grateful we did. So the week of my wedding, um, closed my first house. I quit my job. I was like, Whoa, okay. Back up. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so you closed your first house. I, I, I know what the pressure is of, of being, having to show income and all well, that stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, well, that's the reality of it. Yeah. Well, there's one thing to show income in order to get a mortgage, but there's a whole other thing to actually pay that mortgage every month. For sure. So you quit your lucrative six figure job. Yeah. Was your wife or wife fiance? She was a teacher. The... She graduated. She's a, she was a teacher in Toronto. So she was just started. So she wasn't able to carry that mortgage no. on her own. No. Okay. So what were you thinking? So I, looking back now, it's so funny. People ask me like, Oh my God, like you must've had say I had nothing. Like I didn't have any savings or no, no, Family support, like financially. Okay, so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta dive into this yeah. because you have to explain to me what's going through your twenty six years old, twenty yeah. six, twenty seven. Yeah, it's, yeah, twenty twenty five, twenty six. Yeah. Okay, so you're twenty six years old. You just showed a six figure salary, plus I'm guessing your wife's income as a teacher. Yep. In order to purchase your first home, which by the way is it was a townhouse in Toronto. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a huge accomplishment at twenty six to already own real estate. People aren't doing that today, and people even back then people weren't doing it. It wasn't yeah. that long ago. It was yeah, like yeah, five yeah, years ago. Yeah, yeah. So I guess my 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 question is is that what were you you so you had to show both incomes in order to get the mortgage. Once you get the mortgage, you move in, you close. Great. Now you have these monthly payments. Yeah. So what were you thinking quitting your job? Like what was the logic behind it? What happened was during these five and a half, five years that I worked in finance, and I mentioned I was painting every night and weekend, and although I wasn't making money doing this, small opportunities started to come up. I was reaching out to interior decorators, architects, like anyone that would listen that had to do anything with art, I was reaching out to daily. Every single night, all I did was paint. And and I didn't have a goal for it, but I was just trying to work on my craft and, and outreach. It was just massive outreach every single day. Small opportunities started to come up, and I, I did a mural here, I did a mural there, and specifically, there was a mural that came up in New York at this new hotel, and I remember going to my boss, my new boss, this new company, that I was like very excited to go work for, because I was making double money, and he's like, well, you're taking off a week? I had I had vacation hours. He, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, you I'm- just I'm, started working. Just started working, you but- You started to take a week, and you took a I week I wanted off. to take a week off, like two months into my, uh, no, sorry, three months into my, my job. Mm-hmm. I actually had it, I was allotted it, I was allowed to, um, but I told him what I was doing. I was going to do a mural in New York. He's like, a mural. He's like, you're not an artist, bro. Like, don't. who was he to tell you though? After knowing you for three months, that you're not an artist. You well, are, he was you paying are me a lot of money, and I was sitting in a cubicle. So do what we say. And I don't mean that negatively to him. That was just that was his role, and that's fine. He was a director, and he got to where he got into in life by sure. by having that work ethic. And his, it wasn't even. I I don't even say that to bash him. I say that to he was he was that brain that minded. And I was like, well, I have so much more I want to do in life. And it was the first time I really realized, listen, money matters. We have our friends have Money Buys Happiness podcast. Money matters. Please don't let me change, say that otherwise. But there was this tone of happiness that I needed, this tone of fulfilling something that I needed to try. And you mentioned it early was, I could just go get another job. I just got this job pretty easily, actually. Some, they, they headhunted me. I'm like, wait, if I'm going to give this art thing a chance. So I turned down that mural because he told me no. Really? A month, so a month later, that mural comes back up, and they're like, "Listen, the artist that we hired flopped on us. We need you here." I was like, "And they were gonna done. obviously pay you for that." Yeah, it was like two grand. It wasn't much money. Right. It wasn't. Again, it didn't justify all of these little tipping points, all these little things that I had going on. Didn't justify me quitting my job. So looking back now, you asked me like, how 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 was that transition? I looking back, I don't even know how I made the transition because I actually had not enough going on to justify the finances. I just knew that if I gave it my all. Like genuinely put everything that I had into this, I would make it work. 
I gave myself no backup jobs. I gave myself, my, my dad's friends offered me like remote jobs, all these different things. I'm like, no, if I take in money from anywhere else, I'm going to lose focus on my one goal, which is being the biggest artist in the world. I want to Why did you want focus to be, on this. Why did you want to be an artist? I mean, at this point, you know, you, you've tried baseball. Yeah. I wouldn't say you failed in baseball. You, you saw it through. Yes. And as you said, you're bought, you, you did the maximum that you could. You were satisfied with your baseball yes. career. Okay. So you, you know, you did that, um, with finance, you were still pretty early in your finance career. I mean, yeah, you were, very early. You were in your, I was an analyst, so just a, right. an entry you're, you're, level, like a still a point. Right, you, you know, and now before that even has a chance to take off, you're like saying, okay, now I want to go full force into being an artist. So I guess my question to you is, why? Why yeah. didn't you see through? Why didn't you see finance through? Was it just a raw passion that you needed to be an artist? Because you mentioned to me, sorry, before you answer yeah. the question, you mentioned to me that you were in even in college which it hadn't been that long since you had been gone, even in college, it was only 1% of your time. Yeah. So you weren't as passionate about art. You were more passionate about baseball and getting your degree. Definitely. Right. So then how did that mental transition happen with this, like, you know, you have your 100K, a, you just bought your house. You've got, like, how did this happen? There was a there was a, a pivotal um, turning point in a situation that happened at, at work. And I won't say the gentleman's name or, or, or the role he had, but I remember one evening, and I, I didn't have kids at the time. I had just got, like, I was just, you know, I was engaged. I was getting married soon, and I knew I wanted a family one day, and, and hopefully my you know kids would play sports. And I remember this one evening, um, he was a top director at the firm, and he goes, uh, he's like, I'm just going to stay late tonight. I'm just going to tell my wife I'm working late. I don't want to take my kid to hockey. And I go, and he, this guy made a lot of money. I couldn't fathom, and I, I, I couldn't fathom what he said. And I was like, all I want to do is like one day have a family and hopefully take my kids to sports or like whatever they want to do. And I was like, I'm fighting to be this dude. Well, I, I, he probably made a time. I have no idea. Half a million bucks. He was a top director of a massive fund, publicly traded fund. He was making excellent money, drove a Maserati, did all, had all the trinkets. And I was like, I'm fighting to be him to still sit in the cubicle. Just, just to, to not take my kid to sports. What I'm like, Freedom and happiness matters way more than being this miserable. So guy. that was the turning point. That, that was conversation with him, singular conversation, wow. was was one of the. There was all these little things, but that was one thing. I was like, I knew that. I mean, he was fifty, and I'm like, twenty five years. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to want to take my kid to bit hockey. Is that what I'm fighting for here? Or like, it, the it, he proved that money didn't didn't matter because he didn't want to go home to his kids. I don't know if he, whether he liked his wife or not. I don't know, but I'm saying my guess, he, my guess, sorry to interrupt you. My my guess is that he was making because of the amount of money he was making, he had created a certain lifestyle for himself that he it was a trap that he had to continue making yes. that amount of money in order to maintain his lifestyle. The golden handcuffs are real. The golden handcuffs are real. Yeah, and, and I saw that. And I, I think I was always very aware. And even going back to like when I was younger, you mentioned like, how did I try these different things? I was just very aware. And I saw people that were happy and not happy. And I saw why they were happy. I saw relationships. And like, and I, I realized that in my wife as well. Like I saw the, the relationship that we had and how nice we were to each other. And I was like, I want to hold on to that with everything I can. And that was so. That was one of the biggest tipping points for me. I was like, "Well, I can get another job somewhere," but I'm like, "Why don't I give this thing?" And I, I, I knew art could give freedom, not financial freedom, time freedom. Paint when I want. I can paint all the time. I can be around my wife. Um, and I, you know, I can be home when I want because I would paint on my terms. And I said, "Well, that's what I want to make work." And um, so that was the. I haven't talked about that much. You know, genuinely, like that that tipping point for me is actually the first time I've probably publicly said it. Um, it is. But it was the the main pivotal m moment in my life. I remember telling my wife, she's probably the only other person that knows that story, is that like he said he doesn't want to take his kid to hockey. I was like, I can't, I can't fathom that. And I, I, I know my son like plays little sports. Right? He's only three and a half. But like, all I want to do is take him. And I was like, I don't, want, I don't ever want to be that guy. And that's why I left. So that's why you left. For sure. So what were you thinking that was going to happen financially? Like, how did you think you were going to continue paying your bills? <laughs> genuinely at that time I was so I believed in myself so much I looking back I have no clue that's the that is the true answer to it we had enough like it sounds crazy we had enough for three four months of the mortgage I was like I'll give myself three months and I'll, I'll just figure it out um so but very early like I that this is six and a half almost seven years ago I was in Yorkdale for five years which means and I've I got into Yorkdale very quickly after I quit and the reason I did it is because I was I didn't have enough money to like rent a space in Yorkdale, so I, I had to think creatively again. And this is what because because I needed to make it work. 
I had to start thinking of a bunch of ideas. I started reaching out to galleries and people. No one's listening to me. Same thing when I had they no internships. I had no art experience. Okay. So I, I, I reached out to Yorkdale because I grew up there. I grew up around the corner from Yorkdale. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I want to rent. My first space was across from the Lego store just down from uh, Rolex and Michelle Baguette. Yeah, I know where it is. That's, and, a, that's a prime. That sounds like a prime space. Yeah, it was like right in the center of the mall. Yeah. They had this open space. And I'm like, I, I rented the leasing department. I'm like, I want to rent there. Like I'm like I have a gallery. I'm like no, I don't. I don't have anything. And they're like, well, it's fifty five thousand a month. And I was like, I was like, I was like, I that that number doesn't even make sense. I mean, how can you fathom? But so I thought of this idea. I was like, well, as a joke, I started it as a joke. I was like, I can afford two days. And they had never done a short term pop up. They've done month long pop ups, six month pop ups. But I was like, give me a weekend. I'm like, give me a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I will throw a party here. I'll bring PR. I had no idea how to do any of this stuff, but I had done these little shows with my family and friends that I could, I proved concept. I had photos, I had videos. And they're like, if you're crazy enough to believe that you can do this, we're crazy enough to believe in you. And they had an incredible team there. I'm so, so grateful for them. They gave me the three days. We, I mean, finance, I had to make the finances work. They took a percentage of port, proceeds and everything. We opened up on Thursday night, Saturday morning, all 30 paintings sell out. Wow. And they're like, well, what was you, the average? What was the average price? That, of that point was around four thousand a piece, thirty five hundred to four thousand. So, hold on a second. So you did one hundred twenty thousand dollars in revenue in like three days. Wow. Yeah. And okay. So hold on. Sorry, I gotta I gotta stop you here. Um, how did you sell them? Like, how is it? How is it? It was so s- different. The Yorkdale, and you know Yorkdale, but for anyone that doesn't, it, it is a, it is a luxury mall, and people, the clientele is there. And the number of people that are walking through that mall every single day is staggering. So for me, again, it's like, I only had 30 pieces. Like in my head, I was like, are you telling me that 30 people out of the hundreds of thousands that come through a month, 30 of them are qualified buyers? I believe they are. They're qualified. Sorry, they're qualified buyers, but they're buying, they're spending $4,000 as an impulse buy because you have no brand at this time. Exactly. You don't have a, it's not like. No, I did not. You're there and people are recognizing. It was just different enough. It never been done in a mall. Like genuinely, like you mentioned Peter Lake, who was doing it in the U.S. Yeah. In Canada, it still hadn't been done. Like a personal gallery. It was called the Anthony Ricciardi Art Gallery. And it was all my art and I was there. I painted in the back of it. So people can like, I was painting in the, people can come see, watch me paint, meet with me, talk with me, talk about the art. And like people were walking by and I was there all day, you know, the 12 hours that it's open. I was there all day and night. And that's how it happened. So on those three days, everything sells out. They go, do you want to extend to Friday? I'm like, yeah, of course. So I extend another week. That week turned into a five-year relationship with them at three different locations, and I had very. I ended up doing that gallery was uh, twelve hundred square feet. I ended up moving into a twenty-two hundred square foot gallery beside the bay, across from Harry Rosen, and over there. And then we moved to another one, an even bigger one, um, beside Cheesecake Factory, facing the outside of the mall. All because I took a chance on myself in those three days, and I just said, "I'm not going to give myself any other chances. I have to make this work," and that's what I did. Well, I'm well. I'm really blown away. I still can't wrap my head around the fact that people made an impulse buy for four thousand dollars from an unknown artist yeah like that's that's you know i'm pretty impulsive but i have to say if i'm walking in yorkdale and i see an artist if i love the work maybe i'll spend 500 bucks maybe a thousand yeah four thousand dollars how did those negotiations i know i noticed that everyone has their thing like i i just think that it it came down to a numbers game at the end of it. Um, and then like, you just have people that really just appreciated art. I don't know. Like, I, like um, I'm sure what, if someone knew what maybe you spent on watches or someone spends on cars. No, no, I understand. But it's, it's, it, there's it's, established brands. There's established brands. I'm not buying some like, sometimes I'm not buying a watch from a guy, like a brand new watchmaker in a mall. Like I'm, yeah, you yeah. Know what I mean? yeah no, that, that's true. I know but that my watches, is, I know that my watches, that's not, I'm not spending the money. It's just, it's just a transfer of, of currency because my the watches are a currency that I'll, I'll be able to get my money out of them. Yes. But when they're buying from you, they're buying strictly because they like the piece. They're not thinking to flip it. The the yes, there was so there was a having to love the art, but b Yorkdale alone gave me that social proof that I needed for those things. I see. You know, being four doors down from the Rolex store, somebody comes out and walks out of there and sees Anthony Richard and they walk. It was a very beautiful crystal black, black and white gallery. Really, really, really pretty. Um, you know, Valeria did a photo shoot in there. Like it was, it was a, it was a nice space. So this was, a, it was a, it was like one of the storefronts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so how, so if you're only there for a few days, like it's not like you're in the middle of the mall where all the walking traffic is. You're in it, a store. So how did you get? How did you direct them to the store? I just think it was, di- it was just that different because the the people that go to Yorkdale frequent Yorkdale people that are always walking around, like anyone that walked by walked in. Like what is going on here? Because the second part about it, it was very. This was very early in 
photo backdrops for Instagram. And uh, like I would say 80% of the people that came in just took photos. It became it just, an installation. It became an installation. It's like that. Which, which, it's, it's like, sorry, it's like the selfie museum here yes, in Miami. Yes, exactly. That's what I ended became. up opening the second space that I did was a just a self. It was a selfie based museum. Be, the front of it was an art gallery that sold art. The back of it was these large three dimensional installations that I had a pool full of money you can jump in. I had like all these different things. So I made, I, I didn't know I was doing that early on, but 80% of all my, it was all organic traffic that was coming in because people were posting about it. But that's not sustainable. And, and what it I mean wasn't. by that from a business perspective is, yes, the first time you do it, it's a hit. It's like, it's something new. People see it. The traffic walks by. You convert on the traffic from a sales perspective immediately, but that's not sustainable. Yeah. Meaning that's where the it, snowball it, starts. That's where the snowball starts. Because they, they start coming in and now I'm, I'm starting to get clients. So now I'm start, I'm able to do more pieces. It also gives me the confidence to start reaching out to people. So how we said early on about the, the celebrity and stuff. So let's move into that. So now you're established. You're a couple of years into the art gallery. Yep. Sales are coming primarily from... The, Mainly the, 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 the walk by the traffic. Yeah. And I had a, a sm I still have a, like a relatively small social media presence, but I, I believe my social media presence was always deep for art collectors. Like the people that I, I sell art on Instagram still at 25. Sorry, were you, I apologize. Sorry. Yeah. Were you, were you now paying that $55,000 a month? No, we, Yorkdale was always very good with me in terms of the, the structure of, of the lease. So I never, I mean, yes, I had months that I paid more than that. Take it that way. I had months that I paid less. Because it of, was a, because a, it was tied a to percentage. Revenue. Yes. So they were very flexible, and and um, but I had months that I paid less, and I had months that I paid way, way more, depending on what I was making. But I was transparent. They they saw all my finances, and they saw everything. Like I would, I would, I was very open with them because I wanted. I was so grateful for the relationship. Amazing. And and because it did well, they were like, "We'll keep going." And it it, I consistently changed up the gallery enough where we consistently got PR. We had breakfast television in there a bunch and like all the, you know, CTV and all the fun stuff in Toronto, they would come by all the time because it was something different. It was fun. All my artwork has an undertone of inspiration and happiness. And I think that people attra was, were attracted to that. So I start selling, I start selling the art and I start getting the confidence and I was like, okay, well, let me do, do some other shows. Let me open up Yorkville village. Let me open up the pop-ups that I did in Miami. Like all the, I did a bunch of different pop-ups in Miami on the back of all of the media and attention that I was getting in this one, this one storefront in Yorkdale. So because of that, I was able to start reaching out to management teams, to, to the, management the celebrity, teams of celebrities. celebrities. So you you have the gallery, the gallery's doing, I mean, it sounds to me like it's doing well. You continue to have this um, kind of flow of traffic. There's the PR, there's the publicity. And this is all on your back. Did you have a big team at the time? Like in the gallery, it was you and was- My wife, so my wife ended up leaving, she was a teacher. And then like when I opened, like maybe six months into me having the gallery, I was like, well, we're doing well. Uh, it, the finances came relatively quickly yeah. um, because of the art and because of the exposure. So I was like, well, let's take a little break from teaching right. and um, come help me here. We hired a few, we had a gallery employees, but like they were just retail employees. Okay. So here's, here's what I want to know. And, and I'm trying to, I'm going deep because I just, I genuinely am yeah. curious on how you, you know, how you do this, um, you know, how you did this at the time. So your inventory this isn't like you're buying stuff and selling mm -hmm. it. You're creating each piece originally. Yeah. Were you doing prints? I did some prints. I would do like mainly because of social media. I would do like every three, four months I would do a print, but it, they were all originals. So what I ended up working out with, with Yorkdale was the back, you know how all the stores have storage rooms, like for the, like the store's inventory. I was allowed to paint in there. So we, we taped it all off and I, I turned that into my studio, which was a win-win for me because I, I used to paint in my parents' backyard in their greenhouse, like this little 90 square foot greenhouse. Yeah. So I ended up having a studio space to work out of. It was, I was literally finishing paintings, popping them on the wall and like just, just moving How them like that. How quickly were you able to make a painting? I, I, I've always, one one side fun story about why everyone told me not to be an artist. I'm colorblind. I don't know if I mentioned that. You know that what? Earlier. I read that about you. Yeah. I so I, I work in layers. I work a little slower than I need to. The reason, the only time colorblind becomes a really issue is when I try to rush because I don't see the, the colors blending. So what it allowed me to do is create this process where I'm working on like 12 to 15 pieces at a time. I'm, I'm working in layers. I'll add the blue over here. I'll let it dry. I'll add the yellow over here. So Sorry, it, did you know that, the, like, can, you, can your eye distinguish between no, blue and yellow? I, uh, to blue and yellow, yes, but like green and yellow look the same, blue and purple look the same. What happens is if I put blue here and yellow here and it blends and it becomes muddy brown, I don't see that transition happening because I don't see shades. I know I put, I, I read the bottle, it said blue. I read the bottle, it said yellow. All of a sudden it's mud and I don't I don't see it at all. I just like, oh yeah, it's blue and yellow. And my wife will come and be like, did you mean that? <laughs> like this is early in my career. She's like, 
you didn't mean to make this all brown, did you? I'm like, it's not brown, it's blue and yellow. What are you talking about? She's like, no, it's it's not good. Like, okay. the colors are not good. Um, so because of that, I had to figure out a process in which I can paint, still paint a lot, but work in, in layers. So I work in layers. So I'm, it usually takes me about seven days from the start to finish of a painting, just because of all the different layers. So be, but because I had 15 on like on constant go as a painting sold i would pop the other one on the wall or what i would do because i was in a mall i would say this painting will be delivered to you in seven days it'll give me enough time to replace it on the wall and deliver the the how painting that's how, how many hours a day were you working creating uh, all artwork the all hours i was i was just so my seven, wife would work seven in the days front. yeah seven days a week that was the only downfall to have being in a, in a retail space like yorkdale we're open from nine to nine every single day of the week or on sundays it's like uh ten to seven were all the pieces unique all the pieces are one of a kind. How many pieces are you making a week? I, I was a lot. I, I, well, I mean, not every piece always sold. And I, I sort of learned this process as well. If I had, let's say 20 pieces always on go, 10 would, if they would sit, if 10 of those would sit, like if I would take off piece and put a new one up and it sold again, but 10 would sit for like a month and a half, two months, I would take it down, paint over it. I had no shame in, in, in doing that. Cause I was like, well, that piece, I liked it. But now I don't. Love I've it. never heard of this. I mean, look, I'm not. I'm not in the art world, but yeah. you're. No, you're... it's definitely. It's not very art. Like it's not the art world. Well, I th because the traditional art world and what, what I've stayed away from, or where I, I've, you know, it, not by my choice because no one would allow me into it, was the artist paints. They put it into different galleries. The galleries sell it and move on. And mine was very like entrepreneurial gorilla in the style. Like yeah. I was there making this, the paintings. I was there funding the gallery. I was there staffing it. It's it's a very different approach. Um, it sounds to me like you've taken a writ, like the creation of original art, and you optimize the monetization of it. Because when I think of artists, you know, I think of artists who they'll create a piece of art. They'll create art from time to time. They'll yeah. never create it in mass the way you do. And by keeping it limited, that's actually increasing potentially the value of each piece mm -hmm. because it's it's very limited. Even mass, I can't do much. Like even, right. even if it was considered mass, but what it allowed me to do was I was able to build relationships with all of my early collectors, all these people that took a chance on me. We mentioned our mutual friend that you were at dinner with yesterday. I went to his house to install that painting. That not only made a, a forever friendship, but they historically, they have friends that like art too. So now I went, they got to know me. I got to install the piece. They got to meet me. I got so to now talk you're about going the beyond. You're going beyond the store. I've okay. installed. I'm Let's, here. I'm here in Miami yeah. delivering a painting that I do not have to. I could. You're here it. delivering a painting. Yeah, I'm delivering a painting this afternoon to a client in Boca. I did not have to. I Are you? If, it. Is it too? If, if it's too private, you can you can tell me. Although I've seen your prices on your website, but I'm just genuine curiosity. The painting you're delivering to your yeah. client in Boca today. What, what, what's the what, what what's the transaction value of that of that piece? That one was twenty thousand, but they've bought three paintings in the past. So like the client's overall value over the last two years is about eighty thousand. And I don't, uh, yes, to, to to where the question is leaning is like I definitely don't deliver every single painting. Like it's no, smaller pieces, like you know, if it's five to ten thousand, I probably won't deliver it. What would you say is the average? Well, it it sounds to me like it's not just the value of the painting. It sounds to me this is a, a real the relationship. Uh, it's the relationship, hundred percent. Yeah, and it it's led to so many different things. Like a couple uh, a side story is like I delivered a painting to Puerto Rico that I did again did not have to. I delivered it there. I got to meet a friend uh, of the client that I was delivering the painting to. He ended up owning a resort in Antigua. I got to do a mural and paintings for Antigua just because I was there. We went for dinner. You got to meet someone. So I I value that so much and I, that's why i've always I, done I'm, it so okay so what what would be what do you think right now like if you had to if you had to kind of like guess what would be the average um price for one of your pieces the the average uh it's a, between like the 15 to eighteen thousand dollar range because i i do do smaller sized pieces in the five to ten thousand but then i like i mean i just shipped a painting to australia that was 12 foot by six foot it was sixty five thousand, like us wow. so they 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 they, but but they but the the average is around the fifteen thousand dollar price point. That's for like a four foot by three foot, five foot by four foot range price. That's incredible. Yeah, it blows my mind. Like I've never heard such a robust business model applied to original art. And again, yeah. I'm just I'm not you know when I think of guys like you know going back to Peter Lick. I mean, this is photography. All the photography does take a long time as well, but. In any case, no, I'm it's I, prints numbered. And there's, it's there's, prints, right? So well, I bought a piece from him. It's like of the Brooklyn Bridge. It's one of five hundred, but it's still expensive. How much? It's Whoa, what, five grand. I bought this. Yeah, it was, but it was five grand. U.S. back then. Years ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and it's gone up in value, but 
think about that at a print of 500 that's scale that's a scale of a whole different game because he's making he can just print those on demand but why wouldn't you why wouldn't you jump into the print business where you have your piece and you have it even i mean you can literally take you can take the original and sell the original for the price of the original yep but you could potentially like make prints of it I, not even prints like you can actually have hand-drawn copies like are there other artists like you know obviously for people sure. very junior that could hand copy your your uh, yeah <coughs> and, and there are very big artists like there's two artists that come to mind um damien hurst you've probably seen his work before he does like the dot paintings um and some other stuff so damien hurst or jeff coons he does the balloon dog okay um there's a bunch of big artists in the world i mean these paint these artists sell paintings for a million dollars but the way and th this is the next step in my career not only becoming more what's happened now is that my artwork has become more collectible and that's a word that i i the way that people look at watches and different things like this, art is in that category um, at the next level. And that's where my, my next price jumps, you know, when I'm starting to sell in the 30, the 50, the $80,000 price point, not only do these need to retain value, hopefully one day they'll they'll sell at secondary auction markets for for much more. What, so what's happened in that, that transition needs to happen on me focusing more on the artwork and the sales portals being done through through distribution channels like galleries, dealers, private dealers, art collectors that um, have, you know, art buyers under them that like that buy their art for their personal home collections and investment, investment grade art. So that's the the next step for me. But I have, again, only six years in, I have valued the, it's it's sort of handcuffed me a little bit because I valued the the relationship so much sure. to, to build everything. And it's what, it's why it's so unique because I haven't been in that like distribution model where I just sit in, have three artist assistants, which is very normal. What you said is very normal. Like you have three, four assistants yeah. that do my base layers yeah, yeah. that like trace out my things so I can just come in and like sign them. That's a very normal thing in the art world. Um, but because I've been so focused on the second part of it, which is like the relationships and, and building this community around my artwork, um, I haven't got into that yet. And I, and I think I will eventually. Okay. But it is uh, interesting. Yeah. No. Uh, like, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. It's incredible. It's incredible what you've built. I think that, and I'm kind of biased because I'm in the industry, but I think that you've got a massive opportunity, a massive lever to pull with your social media. Because I, I agree with you that your social media currently is underdeveloped. Yeah. And I'm not even talking about from the perspective of like the number of followers, the size of your audience and the engagement rates and all that stuff. I'm talking about the content that you're putting out. Yes. Because to document what you're doing, this whole story, to document the your process, to document, you know, visiting a client, uh, delivering delivering a piece, to document the creation of a piece, like let's say uh, in a, in like a sped up, yeah, uh, you know, of you yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. you know, and and I like, and I'm sure that those the videos are out there. I know, like in the food industry, there's like sped up videos of people creating these dishes yeah. that are very artistic in yep. nature. And I think that if you were to put, you know, cameras um, on your canvas while you sit there and you and you time lapse is what I was looking for. Yep. And you know, the cost of doing something like that is minimal. You do a time lapse, you give it to an editor with the revenues that you're making. You can easily afford, you yep. know, a, a, a production team and, and people to do this. And I think that's a massive lever for you to pull. It's it's one of my biggest downfalls is the, is the the social content because I've been focused on all the other things and and unfortunately felt like I can do it all, but you can't. And and I do have a, a videographer working with me now, and like some of my newer videos are getting a little more clean, and I am documenting. Like I just went to Cleveland last week for an event. I had my videographer filming the whole entire thing and chopping up 14 videos for me and all that fun stuff. Um, it's very important. Yeah. Um, and I need to do a way better job of it. That's the truth. But Well, I just think that that... I think that's going to accelerate. I mean, it sounds like you're, you're already at a, it sounds to me like at a very, uh, but my eyeballs, you, right? It's you're, more, you're at it's... a good trajectory. You're on a, you're on an amazing trajectory, but I believe with advancing your social media, um, I think that's because I totally agree. Like, let's say for example, this podcast, I didn't, I haven't even thought about whether this is going to monetize or not. This is more of a passion project for me with, you know, my main business being the partnership I have with my wife. With you, however, you have a built-in monetization tool, which is the selling of your artwork. Yep. So I think I just some personal no, you're advice. No, I, I, yeah. I'm grateful for it because I, I did a podcast with a gentleman named Brad Lee in Vegas, yeah. and I, I we put out the podcast, and all of a sudden a month later, an art gallery in Australia. It's like I saw that I loved I loved your artwork. Yeah. I want I want to hire you. Come and we did a really big job. We sold two hundred thousand dollars worth of art in Australia from a podcast. Crazy. That's all social media. If I didn't chop up that video post it on social media and he did it on YouTube and all stuff like Correct. that, it would never would have happened. Well, imagine you were doing that. Let's At say, scale. Let's say, let's say you were putting out 
the, with the amount of pieces that you create and the fact that they're all unique, creating time-lapse videos of each one being created, even if you're putting out, like you're telling me how many pieces a week are you creating? Yeah, yeah, like, like how 12 many? to 15. Okay, so document three of them. Yeah. Or document five of them, and they're all unique. So literally, like you can have a reel going up every single day with a time-lapse set to music, and I believe that those reels would do well because the algorithm is looking for watch time. They're looking for how long somebody will stay in that video. Yeah. And the nature of what you're doing is you're starting with a white canvas and then quickly the, you know, that time lapse is showing you creating that piece of art. People are staying till the end because they want to see that piece how of art. Just, I, do, do I, I agree. Mean? It's yeah. that mystery. It's that mystery that you're leaving at the end. It's that kind of, you know, that yeah. prize at the end that they're getting. And if, and if you set it to trending sound, I'm telling you. Like, yeah, no, I, I need, I work, like I mentioned, because of the colorblind thing, I work very sporadically though. That's been my biggest headache, but there is a way around it. There is just always having cameras set up, always having it. Yeah. There, there's a way around it. There's, that's an excuse that I'm using. That I, and I'm aware that it is because there is, there is a way around to do it. And I, and I, I agree. I'm going to, I just don't think, I, I don't think, I think, you know, I'm missing, I'm missing a gap there for sure. No, but this is, I look again, your, your trajectory seems like we, we're not really diving into your financials, but your trajectory seems to be very good. Yeah. But I'm saying this is the kind of thing where you, you won't be able to handle the volume. You yeah. literally won't like, you'll have to build far more infrastructure in terms of the producing these pieces in order to accommodate that volume. But let's jump into your celebrity clients. Let's talk yeah. about, so at the beginning, you know, I, I, you know, I mentioned names like Drake, Shaq, uh, Steve Aoki. Uh, these are huge A-list celebrities. And as I said, in the beginning of this interview, um, you know, these are artists themselves. So you're no longer, well, you probably are selling to like lawyers and doctors and finance sure. guys and, yeah. and business guys. And that's great. But the fact that you've become a favorite of artists who are the, like, who are thought leaders in their respective artistic fields, that must mean a lot. So, yeah. you know, you told me, you started telling me you did this through networking, but all the networking in the world will not, you know, you can put your art, you can, you've gotten your art in front of Drake and Drake, you have your art hanging in, in his yep. home. And you mentioned to me uh, before off camera that you've been in his home, you were there, you met him, yep. you know, you hung that piece of art, which I'm sure that was an incredible experience. I'd love to hear about that. But the, what, you know, before you kind of go into that story, all the networking, so we've already established that you're an expert networker, you've got a great intuition for it. Um, but with all of that, once that piece of art gets in front of these people who are very discerning as artists, um, your art has to speak for itself. So how is it that Drake liked your art? I get yeah. how you got to him through your connections, but yeah, so it was, it wasn't no, for sure. There's, I mean, there's a lot of different stories of how I got to all of these. We'll talk about Drake for specifically. He didn't, it was, it was gifted to him from one of his friends that that's piece specifically and what ended up happening was it's a, it's a two-pronged story with Lil Wayne Lil Wayne's like one of my favorite artists of all time musicians and rappers and one of my good friends a college roommate of mine his name's Euro and he he played late baseball as well ends up getting signed to Young Money so we used to rap together in college he ends up going off and actually becoming an artist um, so he signed to Young Money and it was Lil Wayne's birthday last year and he goes uh, I want to do I want to get a piece for Wayne I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. So we were here on uh, Star Island, went to Wayne's house to 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 bring him um, to bring him this painting. I didn't get to meet Little Wayne that night. He was busy, he got running around, all, all this different stuff. So fast forward to Drake. So we is the OVO fest, and I'm there with little I'm there with Euro. I actually got to go on stage with them. It was absolutely wow. absolutely crazy. It was like the coolest experience ever. And I'm I'm with them after. And so I get introduced properly to Drake. We only met through like mutual friends, like very high. high. And then, so he knew it was my painting. Like, you know, hey, like love your art. Very cool. The coolest thing to me is I had not met Lil Wayne at this, at this point. And we're, we're at Drake's house and he's at, Lil Wayne's on the couch. And Euro goes to him. He goes, hey, you, this is the guy that did the, I did, it, was a, it was a biggie wearing a Green Bay Packers jersey. He's a big biggie fan. He's a big Green Bay Packers jersey. I did all vintage Green Bay Packers this is for, for, for Lil Wayne. For Lil Wayne. for Lil okay. Wayne. Uh, Drake, I'll tell you Drake's piece in a second, but so Little Wayne stands up and comes and gives me a hug, and he goes, "I absolutely love your artwork, bro. I need to get more." And I, I go to Wayne, I go to your my friend Euro, and I text my wife two minutes later. I'm like, "I can retire now." Little Wayne said he likes my art. This is it. I'm done. Uh, this is, there's nothing else to achieve in life. This is the funniest thing. Wow. It's the coolest story to me ever because I I grew up literally loving Little Wayne. He said, "I love your artwork." I'm like, "That's it. I've I've achieved it all." So funny side story, but for the Drake piece, 
I did a collaboration. I'm, I, oh, we, we should we should brainstorm a piece like this for you as well. I did a collaboration with the Bank of Canada. One of my friends is uh, he does the recycling for the Bank of Canada. So when they get defective bills, um, they shred them. They turn it into because our, our money in Canada is plastic. They turn it into um, engineered hardwood flooring and all these different things. They had never allowed someone to utilize the actual bill shredded into into anything. I said I want to turn it into artwork. So I did Drake, and I've done a few of them now. Um, a canvas when when Certified Lover Boy the album came out, it was a canvas made, and I do hearts. All my artwork has hearts in it because yeah. I followed my heart. The canvas is made of money. The whole entire thing is shredded cash, shredded Canadian cash, like a million dollars in cash shredded. Obviously, I didn't pay that for it, but it's just shredded. And big hearts that says Certified Lover Boy. So it was this funny. Um, shredded Canadian money, like take on does money matter and all, all these fun little um, side things. So those are the two stories with Drake and Lil Wayne, but those were very big in my career. And I don't talk about them that much because they do so many different things, but like they were so pivotal to me to give me the, like just the, the handshake and the hug of like, Hey, we like your art, man. That's really cool. When, and when was this? Uh, this was uh, October. Oh, like, so this not, is like not long ago. less yeah, than yeah. a year ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Within the year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was crazy to, to do that. Cause those are two like guys that I, I look up to on for so many different levels, like business, music, you know, just creative. We talked about it early, um, was like being able to do something for that long, that well is so impressive. Um, so then even when, uh, last month when Little Wayne came to, to, t to Toronto for a show, my friend Yuro was there. So we got to go on stage with him again and it was crazy. And we were backstage with Drake and stuff. It was really, really cool. What's that Great like? guys. It was, it, they, they live a whole different world. Their, oh, their sure. world is like, just like, and just, it's opposite time. Like they're, they live in the middle of the night and they live totally different. Like I've been to, uh, I've done 11 and all the, the clubs here in, in Miami with, with Wayne now and, and all those guys and they're, they live a very different world. Um, but very fun. I can I can do it in small doses. Sure, sure. <laughs> like very small doses. Sure. Wow. Like hey, I'll, I'll come out for one night, but I can't I can't last three nights like you guys. Yeah, that's well. I think they're conditioned to it at this point. For sure, they're conditioned sure. to it. Um, well, look, it, 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 it's an incredible story. Uh, I'm trying to kind of draw out the the moral of the story yep. and really the the factors that you know we've talked about the pivotal moments. We've talked about kind of the attitude, the perseverance, really thinking outside of the box, the networking that you had to do and that you continue to do to move, um, you know, to move your career forward. I think like if I kind of looked at the formula of your success, I think at, you know, really at the top of, of kind of why you're successful in terms of like the list of kind of attributes that you have. And it would be the fact that I feel like you're super passionate about what you do. Like you're super passionate about the art that you produce um, you're super passionate about the people that you sell it to, yep. which it, it seems to me like that's a you know that's a winning that's that's a winning formula. And it, I, I'm actually I, I'm I'm trying to get lessons from you in terms of you know thinking about my business with Valeria and advancing you know that business. Yeah, and and really concentrating on the product that we put out and you know our product what we sell is like our you know our brand sponsorships and the content that Valeria creates yep. uh, you know at scale and and really you know taking that and and kind of combining it with the brands themselves the people themselves like the people at the brands uh, the, you know the people who started the brands the creative visionaries behind the brands so but for you getting back you know for you I think I think that combination of, of loving the actual craft loving the products that you produce and loving your clients that, that you sell it to I feel that that's like a really winning combination and of course there's your your, your work ethic is insane like you're working around the clock um, you know your uh, uh, your um, your ingenuity into getting into places by leveraging the assets that you have. These are all, I think, the contributing factors that sum up as to why you're successful. What's next for you? I mean, it sounds like it sounds like it's so unlimited. I feel. What's next for you in terms yeah. of, you know, your art reaching so many more people? What's what's your plan? Well. The, it yeah, no, and thank you for all those kind words. By the way, that, that that's awesome. But I think one big thing um, to go back on on one of those notes about the the relationship with the client is the thing that's so beautiful about arts, and I, I see it with anything creative, is years later after I deliver a canvas, um, I'll get a client message me like, "By the way, I walk by that painting every day, and it still inspires me." And to me, knowing that it has the potential to do that, like a lot of my artwork has writing that's inspirational and the hearts and all this different stuff, is like. 
knowing that my art has this potential gives me the internal motivation to keep going and keep doing this. Like the more homes and walls and people that I can inspire with a painting is is outstanding to me. So I that's one of my biggest drivers to keep doing things. And and really t- t- that leads into my the next step is like I want to do it more. And and what I mean by more is is starting to learn how to leverage the Australia uh, show that I mentioned early was the first time I worked with a third party gallery, meaning that I, I didn't own the gallery. It wasn't my name. They just put my art up and they sold it. It was, it was on, I, it was on um, consignment. Consignment. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they take a percentage, the gallery take a percentage. It. And, um, and that was the first time I ever did that. It went extremely well, but not only ignoring finances for that for a second, it went extremely well because I focused on creating the best art I physically could, and they and I and I have all this back end like we've been sp- talking about to give them the leverage to sell the artwork now, and they went out and, and sold it. And my next step, the next step in my career is really I've tr- I've done so many different things. I started a, a clothing line called Dust of Gods. We painted um, clothing. I, I my my friend still runs it, Antonio. He's he's incredible. We did a lot of jackets and stuff like that. I started a jewelry line. I made like jewelry with I hearts and stuff. Yeah. So I, I started a jewelry line. I've done so many different things. And I, I finally narrowed back into like, I love canvases. I love this. This is where, this is also where the dollars are. And like, I got to sell a lot of jewel- bracelets to, yeah, yeah. to make up one canvas. So from an economic standpoint, I was like, why don't I just focus on making the best art I physically can at the scale that I can right now until I can't. Um, and then start looking at other channels. That's why early we, we spoke about the outreach versus inbound and it's now I'm rebacking into like the outbound because I, I do want to work with bigger brands. I want to one day be a creative director for Tiffany, for Louis Vuitton, for one of these different things, but it would be on the basis of my art, like how Pharrell's doing it now, like how Virgil did it and all these different people. It was on the basis of their, their art, their craft. And then they can take that craft into like all these different brands. Um, I really believe that I, I can provide value for these brands, but I'll need to be bigger as a as a creator. I don't think you'll need to go outbound. I don't think I think that the traditional path that you've took in the past, in various points of your you know of your of your career, where you're reaching out to people, I believe that your product will continue to speak for itself. I believe that doing more interviews like this, um, I think is huge. So I think you know, if I may give you some, if Please, I may no, give you some I, advice. So, so grateful. I believe that with what you do, because you're really tapping into an emotion, right? That with you, rather than going to a client directly, rather than targeting either a celebrity or targeting um, a brand to do like an activation, my suggestion to you would be to target um, podcast hosts. Yeah. Podcast hosts, creators, do collaborations with creators. And I think you're already doing some of that because yeah, that's how you and bit. I that's how you and I kind of met through sure. uh, through our mutual friends. But I believe that's what you need to do. And then what I would do if I were you um, is I would leverage. So for example, like this this interview that we're going to create, there's going to be this long form piece um, which is going to be about whatever like 90 minutes uh, yeah. uh, you know on it's going to exist on YouTube as a video, it's going to exist as audio on my uh, on Spotify. Um, and then there's going to be probably about you know six to eight short form pieces of content that'll be you know my you know my reels. So my suggestion to you would be to leverage these assets going forward and send it to another podcast host where yes. I'm still early in this. Like so. how we did here. Like I, like yeah. I sent you a couple different things. Yeah. Exa- and I'm still early in it as well. And, and by I, the I, way, and by the way, before I knew you and I knew who you were, because honestly, like I hadn't really heard of you before because yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not in the art world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when you sent me the interviews that you did with other notable people, that's what not so much made me decide to ask you to do this interview, that's what made me explore more to then look into your 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 art itself. Yes. To then say, okay, so that was the gateway. So I think that's your leverage. No, for sure. And, yeah. and I, I've noticed that at a small point. And so I thank you for you know reiterating that and saying something that like I've been just dabbling in and I need to go full force it because I, I do believe it's a, I mean, that we have so many different avenues for to put things out into the world. And you know, now um, we'll, we'll, we'll tie things up because I want to take the opportunity, Valeria's in the other room and I want to go and take a look at that wall space. Yeah. But now it's interesting because I'm going to be looking at, like when we're describing to you what we'd like in our space, it's going to be a very, my mindset is now different. I'm not, I'm not looking at what's going to look good in this room. Based on my conversation with you, I'm saying to myself, I want to know what's going to inspire, inspire me. That's Valeria and what's going to inspire Valeria on a daily basis because awesome. our business is very much tied into Valeria's level of inspiration and happiness at any given time for her to be able to create content. 
So when she creates content from a very you know happy and inspired place, and it's hard to get consistency. That's yes. why I'm really impressed with your consistency to be able to continue to create artistic pieces. Because I see with Valeria, it, it does go up and down. For sure. it, it, it is difficult to maintain that That's level why I haven't been able to do it on social. Because I can't, I, doing all the different ones have been difficult. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All my outpours in the canvas and doing it on socials, it takes a whole other outpour. I, I agree. I agree. So with Valeria, so now my motivation and my purpose with this piece is a lot different. Because this is the piece that Valeria and I look, look what's going to be in our bedroom. It's what she sees on a daily basis to keep her inspired. Because you told me that you have that client who mentions to you that your piece continues to inspire me. Yeah. They didn't comment on the aesthetic of the piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They it, comment on how it makes You hope that's them... okay. The, the next step is that like every time they walk by, it's like, I saw that sparkle differently today. I saw that word love differently today. It, it hit me in a different angle. You walk by and you catch something. That's that's the goal. That's why my paintings are so thick in texture. You'll get to see them in person, but thick in texture and layers is because you want to walk by and the light, you have all this beautiful light coming into the house. The light sparkles differently and the painting looks differently at night. And then it does in the day. Like all those different things are so important. And I, I think they, they make for a beautiful, uh, an endless story. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get Valeria to give you kind of some guidance right now as to what piece she wants to see. Yeah. But then I'm going to ask her to watch this podcast in its entirety before you even start the piece. Because I want her to see this and understand your story yeah. a lot more before she gives you kind of final direction on this piece. I love it. Anthony, Easy. on that note, I really want to thank you. This, thank you. The, the, you know, this really, this was such a pleasant surprise. You know, you were referred to me by our mutual friends. I saw that you were on those other podcasts. I, you know, I looked into your, uh, into your career, and this was so much more than I thought it would be. So I, you know, I really want to thank you, and I hope that you can come back. I hope that in a couple of years, I want to catch up with you. Yeah, to yeah, see no, of course, to so. see what's up. You can tell me more stories about hanging out with all these, <laughs> yeah, that's it. all these stars. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That's it. Thank you.